Would you pray with me? Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that we may hear your word and obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, how do you welcome people into your home? My father's actually worshiping with us tonight, and my parents taught me by example that everyone who enters your home needs to be offered something to drink as soon as they get in the door. But the rules of hospitality and the rules of being a guest are different from house to house and especially from culture to culture. For example, in India, it is considered rude to leave anything on your plate at the end of a meal. But in Iran, it is considered rude to not leave anything on your plate. In South Korea, it is considered a compliment to the host if you slurp your soup. In Poland, it is considered rude to show up to a dinner party and not have brought a drink. In Morocco, all guests are offered mint tea and it is considered rude to refuse it. And in ancient Israel, Foot washing was a sign of hospitality. It was a way to welcome strangers to your home. Traditionally, it was performed by a servant who would scrub the dust of the desert streets off of the guest feet before eating. And the one who did the foot washing was often an inferior, a servant, a slave. Which is why it makes the disciples, and Peter in particular, squirm when Jesus silently stands and takes off his outer garment and wraps a towel around his waist. But this is more than just an act of hospitality or hygiene. And they all watch as Jesus, their teacher, their master, their rabbi, bends down and begins to wash their feet. He washes off the dust of the streets. He washes off the flecks of refuse from chamber pots dumped in the streets of Jerusalem. They watch as he silently takes on the role of a slave. And this act of washing the disciples' feet here in the Gospel of John, it serves to us as a preview of what's to come. Just as Jesus performs the service of a slave here, soon he will be crucified, which was the normal Roman form of execution for slaves. Just as Jesus willingly kneels to wash his friend's feet, soon Jesus will willingly lay down his life for them. And something about this really rubs Peter the wrong way. Maybe he just cannot take how many social conventions Jesus is crossing here. Maybe Peter feels some sort of discomfort with Jesus putting himself in that position. And all these thoughts and feelings must have been swirling around in Peter's mind as he watched Jesus wash each disciple's feet around the table. And when it finally came time for him For Jesus to kneel in front of him, Peter says, oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to participate in this sham. You're not washing my feet. But Jesus tells him, Peter, unless you let me wash you, you have no share with me. See, there's something about this act that Jesus performs that somehow is closely tied with what it means to follow him. This act of washing the feet, this act of pouring himself out, of taking the very form of a servant, seems to be a signpost for us of the cross itself and points to the love that will drive Jesus there. And Jesus says to Peter, unless you accept that love, you cannot truly follow me. 
And that's when Peter catches a glimpse of what Jesus is saying and his eyes go wide and in his wonderfully brash and honest way, he declares, well, heck, you better wash my hands and head as well then. I just love Peter. But you know, Peter is not actually who catches my attention this evening. There's somebody else present in that room. Somebody else who is sitting in a corner being very silent. His name is Judas. John tells us that Judas has already listened to the lesser angels of his nature and has decided to betray Jesus. But John does not tell us that Judas has left. Judas is still there. Judas is in that room. Imagine with me the moment when Jesus comes to Judas. He silently slips off Judas's sandals. He lovingly places Judas's feet in the basin of water. He washes them and dries them. And the whole time, Jesus knows exactly what Judas is planning to do. And yet, he washes his feet just like everybody else. I wonder what Judas was thinking in that moment. Maybe he had a gnawing feeling of guilt. Or maybe he was sitting there thinking, this is exactly why I'm betraying you. This is exactly why I'm turning you in. Here you are the supposed Messiah, and you're acting like a slave. You're no Messiah to me. Where's your backbone? Where's your pride? You know what? You deserve what's coming to you. And regardless of what Judas was thinking, Jesus bends his knees and washes his feet, just like he'd done to every other disciple. And after Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples, he turns to them and he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also should you love one another. Jesus seems to be saying, what I have just done for you, you must do for one another. As Gina mentioned earlier, today on the church calendar is Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy comes from the Latin word mandatum. It's where we get our word mandate. And it refers to this new mandate, this new commandment from Jesus. Like Jesus, we are to love one another, love one another sacrificially. Now, Against my better judgment, I have a Twitter account. And most of the time, Twitter is just a cesspool of half-baked opinions. But every once in a while, by the grace of God, I, I do stumble upon something that is actually profound. Jess Bond is an Australian artist and a Christian. Not long ago, she created a series of prints she's called the Foot Washing Series. Each print depicts Jesus stooping down to wash the feet of somebody different. One image is of Jesus washing the feet of a Black Lives Matter activist. The other is of a police officer. One shows Jesus washing the feet of an anti-vax protester, and the other shows him washing the feet of someone advocating for vaccines. One is of Jesus washing the feet of a gay man. One is of a child playing in a basin as Jesus washes their feet. She recently created an image of Donald Trump having his feet washed by Jesus and another of Joe Biden. And her most recent prints show Jesus washing the feet of a Ukrainian mother. And the other is of Jesus washing the feet of a Russian soldier. On that night, Jesus gathered with his disciples and he knew exactly what Judas was planning to do. And yet, 
He washed Judas's feet along with everyone else's. And Jesus tells us that is the kind of love we are called to embody towards one another. That's the kind of love we're called to embody to our neighbors. Now, loving others does not require you to agree with them on everything. Loving others does not absolve some people of the wrong that they do in the world, and we should still hold evil accountable. But loving others in the way that Jesus commands us is about recognizing that regardless of how different we might seem, regardless of people that we may even consider to be our enemy, someone who might betray us, someone who makes our skin crawl, in reality, they are loved by God. And they have as much need for salvation as you do. A few years ago, when I was pastor of a small church in Missouri, I was in my office and I was getting ready for worship one Sunday morning when a man from the church burst into my office and with a red face, he said, Preacher, who moved my sign? And I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, Somebody moved my sign and I don't like it. And I just stared back and I told him I would try to find out what was going on. And it turns out that the man had placed a sign on the wall in the hallway that indicated what room his Sunday school class met in. So he, he and the three other people in his class could find their way to the class that they'd been in for 40 years. The youth had had an event the night before and someone must have accidentally knocked the sign off the wall. And so I just printed a new sign and I taped it up. And the man looked at me and he said, next time do your job and make sure nobody messes with my sign. I was angry and I was worked up. And this happened right before worship. Side note, complain to us after worship, okay? <laughs> I was still angry when I walked down to the table in that service to say the words of institution over communion. And I was still angry when I offered the congregation the body and the blood of Christ. And I was still angry when the first person to walk towards the front was this man. And he had big tears in his eyes and he came forward and I handed him a piece of bread and I said to him, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And I handed him a cup and I said, this is the blood of Christ poured out for you. And he lifted his eyes and he just said, thank you, Lord. And then as communion was nearing its end, I had not had the bread or the cup yet. And I was getting ready just to pick one up and take it when this man came forward. This man who had formerly yelled at me for no reason, this man who I had been seething about the whole service, this man handed me the body and the blood of Christ. And together we ate it in remembrance of our Savior. I needed that salvation more than anybody else in that room. And that's why I think about Judas. I think that it's easy to accept grace and accept love when we don't feel like we've done anything wrong. But what about when you are broken? What then? Most of you probably know the name of the author, Madeline Lingle, as the author of the children's novel, A Wrinkle in Time. But, but she also wrote a collection of short stories. And one of my favorite short stories of hers tells an apocryphal tale about Judas in the afterlife. Judas Iscariot finds himself at the bottom of a deep and slimy pit. And for thousands of years, he weeps his repentance. And when all his tears are finally spent after millennia, he looks up and he sees way, way up at the top of this pit, a tiny glimmer of light. 
And after he'd contemplated this for another thousand years or so, he begins to try to climb up the slimy walls of this pit. The walls of the pit were dank and slippery, and he kept falling back down. And finally, after years and years of trying, he finally gets to the top. He reaches the top, and he drags himself into a room where he finds 12 people seated around a table. And he sees Jesus. And Jesus says to him, Welcome, Judas. We've been waiting for you. We couldn't begin until you arrived. We are called to follow Christ into that reckless kind of love Because sisters and brothers, that reckless kind of love has been shown to us. Because just as Jesus bent down to wash his disciples' feet, in a few days, those same hands that used water to clean his friends' feet would have nails driven through them. Jesus took on the role of a slave at this Last Supper, and he will die the death of a slave on Calvary. And He does that for you and for me. Thanks be to God.